Today's reading is from Genesis 16, verses 1 through 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar, and Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go to my slave girl, and it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived for ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar, And she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are Elroy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Ber Elroy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, who Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 60, 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. worship service this morning that you have an opportunity to write any sermon notes or if you hear any prayer requests here this morning that you want to add to take home with you you have a space for that as well I've also added a few sections here where uh, reflection questions if you'd like to have them as personal reflection or with any loved ones you'd like to share with this week over the past few weeks we have learned about a handful of extraordinary women in scripture Two weeks ago, Pastor Meredith and I discussed the story of Ruth and Naomi. Last week, I preached about the story of Esther and Vashti, two women who changed the political landscapes of their time for just such a time as this. This morning, we conclude this series by retelling the story of Sarah and Hagar. The lives of these women, both recorded in the book of Genesis, are intertwined with one another. Unlike the story of Esther and Vashti, this is not about good versus evil. We cannot vilify one person and make the other person a saint. This is a tale of two mothers, two mothers who love their sons in remarkable ways. Will you pray with me, please? Loving and gracious God, we come before you this morning, and I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts give you glory, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all the things that have happened to each one of us as individuals, we come before you as a collective people. And we ask that this time may be sacred because we worship you, the holy God, as we sing our songs, as this word is preached and proclaimed. As we learn more about the story of Sarah and Hagar, God, open our hearts, our minds, our ears, all that we are in such a way that we can experience you, the loving and living God, in a new and a powerful way. And God, we give you thanks for who you are, Just as you are God who loved and loves Hagar and Sarah, you love us. Amen. Let's take a closer look at the scripture read this morning. It starts with Sarah who is unable to have children. And Sarah believes that it is God preventing her from having a son. 
Following Sarah's instruction, Abraham takes their Egyptian slave Hagar to conceive a son. Hagar is a female slave who really has no say in this decision. At this point in scripture, we do not know her thoughts or her desires. That is, until she bears the son of Abraham, whom she names Ishmael. Scripture tells us that God has a plan for Hagar. Let's continue here. Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, they live in their new family structure with Ishmael as an heir for just over 10 years. After these years, Sarah miraculously gives birth to Isaac, whose name means he laughs. As Isaac and Ishmael grew up, we learn that they are friends at a very young age. And their friendship and Ishmael's threat to Sarah's son's inheritance caused Sarah to become wildly jealous of Hagar and Ishmael. And Genesis reads that Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar. Something important to note here is that Abraham and Sarah, they owned Egyptian slaves. This is a detail that can be easily overlooked. Fast forward to the book of Genesis, and we find that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And we're told that Pharaoh dealt harshly with them. In both cases, the Hebrew word is used, the same one, harshly. It can be defined as verbal, emotional, and most certainly physical abuse. The phrase, violence begets violence, comes to mind. Hagar names her son Ishmael. Ishmael's name means God hears. And after God spoke to her, we can read in Genesis 16, 13, that she named the Lord who spoke to her, you are Elroy. And she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? So often in scripture, God gives a person a new name. And occasionally, God reveals God's name. But here we have a unique moment where Hagar names God. It's also very important to notice that God is not just making promises to Abraham. God also has a plan for a foreigner, a slave, a person who is clearly outside of God's chosen people as defined in the rest of the book of Genesis. Hagar names God, and God reveals God's plan to someone who is outside of the Hebrew people. The theme, God is a God who hears, is one of the most important motifs in all of Scripture. 400 years later, God hears the cry of the Israelites when they are slaves in Egypt. God hears their cry for help when they wander the desert for 40 years. God hears the cry of the lowly and the oppressed when they are beaten and trampled by their neighbors in Canaan. And God hears and sees the pain of women who wept outside of Jesus' tomb. And here, in the infancy of the story of humankind's relationship with the Creator, God sees and hears the cry of the lowly and oppressed female slave. We learn from these few verses that the lives of Hagar and Ishmael are not the accidental aftermath of simple choices of Abraham and Sarah. This is not one of those making lemonade out of lemon situations either. Hagar's call story is clearly in line with God's plan for the rest of the world to redeem the world. Hagar runs away, and God seeks her out and tells her to return and submit. And Hagar returns, only to be treated harshly once again. Hagar and Ishmael run again, and this time they run to preserve their lives. While in the wilderness, Hagar and Ishmael, they are on the brink of death. They are on the brink of death until Ishmael cries out. And God hears Ishmael, and God speaks to Hagar. And then God shares with Hagar God's promise for her and for her family. God hears the cry of Hagar. This is certainly one of the most powerful moments in their story. No matter how dark, no matter how deep, no matter how sad or frustrating moments may be, God hears the cry of God's people. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them, light has shined. Have you ever heard that saying, the Lord helps those who help themselves? Well, Abraham and Sarah, they thought they were practicing this well-intentioned yet incorrect principle. They're helping themselves to God's promise by taking it into their own hands. Something that's often missing here in early Christian education is the vital role that Sarah plays. Sarah plays. 
If we read just a few chapters earlier than what was read here, Abram and Sarah, that's their names before they met God, and God renames them, um, they moved to Egypt because there was a famine in their land, Genesis 15. And they moved to Egypt in order to survive. Sarai finds favor in the Pharaoh's eyes because he believes that she is the sister and not the wife of Abram. Their story of survival is contingent upon Abram and Sarai lying to Pharaoh. So whatever conspired between Abram, between Pharaoh and Sarai, was enough to entice the Pharaoh to give them a livelihood and land. It's hard to imagine the incredible things that Sarah had done in order to care for her family and for their future. There are so many themes in this story that are relevant to our times and our culture and are also prominent throughout the Bible. Let's begin with one of the biggest themes that we can find in all of Scripture, the barren womb. Starting with Eve and throughout the entirety of Scriptures, the womb is either filled with child or it is bare. Clearly, there are both literal and figurative meanings for both individual and families and a plan for the people of God. Like many cultures, there is a great significance placed on having a male son in the Israelite culture. To bear a son in Abraham's day, it meant that your family lineage would continue and they would more likely prosper. In the scripture passage, Abraham and Sarah, they chose another option to try to fulfill the promise God gave them. They practiced what is called polykoity, which is a common practice in Sarah's time. It meant that Abraham would take a slave as his secondary wife. When Ishmael was born 13 years before Isaac, Ishmael, for those years, was considered to be the rightful heir to the land and property of his father. An unfortunate truth that is both true then and often today is that a woman's value can be directly related to her ability to bear a son. Now, you and I know that today the father is responsible for the gender of a child. But for thousands of years, women were blamed when the baby was not the preferred male gender. Earlier in Genesis, we read that Sarah was a person of great beauty. She's a person whose beauty helps her and her family in order to survive while they were strangers in Egypt. Well, not just survive, really. As we read in the scripture, they flourished. But no matter how important her role was, despite the countless ways that she sacrificed, she worked and she toiled. Her societal value was defined by her inability to bear Abraham a son. A second theme is conflict. In this story, there's a conflict between Sarah and Hagar. Both women were from vastly different ethnic cultures. Sarah, the wife of a very wealthy tradesman, she was in the position of power and privilege. Hagar was an Egyptian woman who lived a life of servitude with seemingly no economic resources. As I read the story of Sarah and Hagar, I can't help but notice that it's really a story about Sarah's conflict with Hagar more than it is Hagar's conflict with Sarah. When God promises Abraham and Sarah a son, it was Sarah's idea to practice polykoity. And once Hagar is promoted to the status of secondary wife, and she has Ishmael, it's Sarah who blames Abraham for her idea. Now Hagar, in scripture, she does pop just a little bit of attitude when she has Ishmael. But that's the only instance that we can see that she actually struggles with Sarah. And now we come to one of the toughest things that happen in their story. We can read about it in Genesis chapter 18, verses 8 through 9. It reads this. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, return and submit. Why? Why did God tell Hagar to return to Sarah? Why would God ask Hagar to return to verbal, physical, and emotional abuse that she would surely endure after running away? There are a few theories that biblical scholars have used to try to make sense of this command by God. First, Hagar was the rightful property of Sarah. I use the word rightful very lightful here, very lightly here, and I only want to use it in the context of this story. Her value and her son's value were intertwined with Abraham as they were their property. I don't really like that explanation of this biblical scholar, actually. It's the same type of economic and sociological issues that slaveholders use when slavery was once legal in the U.S. 
So there's a second option. Hagar was told to return to Sarah for her own good. One scholar noted that a practical question in posing this hypothesis is this. How could Hagar possibly care for her son in the wilderness as a runaway slave? The hard truth is, it would have been unbelievably difficult for them to survive. A third theory comes from me. God could have asked Hagar to return to Sarah in order to give Sarah a second chance of doing what is right. Maybe the issue wasn't God telling Hagar to return to Sarah as her property. Maybe it was really about God trying to give Sarah, and really Abraham too, a chance in order to make things right. Unfortunately, Sarah does not. And she makes things all the worse, and she forces Hagar to run away for good. Theologian Dolores Williams, she said this about Hagar when she returned to Sarah. She said, The truth of the matter may well be that the Bible gives us license to have it both ways. God, liber God liberates, and God does not always liberate the oppressed. God speaks comforting words to the survival and the quality of life struggle of many families. She goes on to say that our theology needs to have room for God to be at work supporting and caring for those who are oppressed within the structures from which there is no apparent escaping. Friends, the truth is, is I'm not 100% comfortable with any of these options. But I do subscribe most closely to a mixture of these two final thoughts. Otherwise, how can you and I begin to make sense of sex trafficking and rampant child pornography that we see in our world today? Does God predestine innocent children to live horrible lives of exploitation? No. Unequivocally, no. Does God meet the oppressed victims exactly where they are? In the darkness, in the loneliness, in the sadness, does God know us and love us completely just as we are? Despite how other people's free will and power, they may impede and exploit our own powerlessness. It does not mean that God does not have a plan or that God is not listening to the cry of all people. God cries with us when our lives are in the deepest moments of pain because it is not what God intends for our world. It is not the plan, but there is still a plan. My wife Elaine once told me when we were doing youth ministry together, she told me one of the most profound theological truths about God that I contemplate still today. She said this, she said, God cries with a 13-year-old whose heart is broken for the very first time. God cries with a 13-year-old whose heart is broken for the very first time. Our God, whom we have come to worship this morning, is not a vain and callous deity who floats around us as some ethereal, unmoved being by the happenings of the world that God created. God does not hear the prayers that you and I give each day, each morning, on a Sunday morning with an attitude of saying, I've been there or I've done that, or saying to us, I hurt you because I love you. Rather, God lives, God loves, God knows and is active in our world today through each one of us as a God of true compassion, as a God of empathy, as a God who offers love like no other. And God's perfection manifests in Jesus. Jesus who wept for his people, who was angry at the sight of those who would abuse their power and their privilege. This is the God whom we worship. God who heard the cry of Sarah who turned her tears into joy. God, who heard the cry of Hagar, who listened to her voice in the wilderness, in the darkness, when there seemed to be no hope. God, who knew her, who knew both Sarah and Hagar, and loved them completely. That's our God. I find it powerful that God told Hagar to name her son Ishmael, because the Lord has seen her affliction. Never forget that Hagar's experience of God is that God sees her and he hears her, Elroy. In Exodus 2, verses 23 through 25, it says this, The Israelites, they groaned under their slavery and they cried out. And God heard their groaning. And God looked upon and saw the Israelites. The same God, the same name, that Hagar gives to God is the same translation that we find here 400 years later, Elroy. God saw and heard the Israelites in their distress. Long before the Hebrew people's cry, God heard the cry of Hagar, an Egyptian slave. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring 
that they cannot be counted for the multitude. So from here on out, when you hear, when you read, when you talk about the stories of Abraham and Sarah, remember how much Sarah loved her son Isaac. Remember the sacrifices she made for her family. Remember that she tried her very best to ensure that her family would not only survive, but try to thrive as well. But I also want you to remember God's servant Hagar. Hagar, an Egyptian woman who cried out, who cried out in the wilderness, and God saw and heard her. Remember that Sarah and Hagar's story, a tale of two mothers, is our story as well. Remember when we pray today that we pray to a God who hears our cries, who knows our joys, God who hears us. Amen.